I guess it's going to be the most technical talk for today, but uh, um, someone had to do it. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's. I, I, I will try to be short <laughs> and just uh, highlight some uh, workflow, let's say, and to, to put on the table several tools that can be used, and in fact they have been extensively used in Western music, and uh, I believe that they can be used with in, in the framework of the Com Music project. However, one should always be uh, cautious about using these tools blindly. So I will try to highlight the places where a, a specific contribution, depending on the type of music considered, needs to be done. Okay. So, well, uh, I mean, Xavier has introduced me, so this part I can skip it already. <laughs> So uh, this talk is uh, titled Machine Learning for Music Discovery, and it has uh, two or three focus. So the, the main focus is trying to learn labels from audio data. So it's going beyond the single processing part and trying to bridge the semantic gap that Xavier was mentioning in the morning. So trying to learn some semantics about a given signal. This is called music automatic annotation, or it can be called uh, several names. So basically, we learn labels or categories from a music signal. But there is another focus of the talk, which is the query by example paradigm. So this is a very easy paradigm, very used in music discovery when you want to buy something in iTunes or when you, when you want to search for music. Basically, is you provide an example, you provide a signal which acts as an example. And there is a system, a black box for the user, that returns you items, music documents, that are similar in some respect to your example. I hope this becomes clear later. But these two things, learning labels or automatic annotation plus query by example, that's what I call category-based retrieval. So basically, you want to retrieve items. By the way, when I speak of items, I mean I can mean uh, a whole music recording, just a part of it. So you decide what is an item, and the, an item depends on the task. I will try to stick to item, music item, music document, but maybe sometimes I speak about the song or something like that. So keep in mind that. So I call it category-based retrieval. And finally, in the end of the talk, I will highlight some of the issues that need to be. Uh, taken into consideration when using machine learning approaches for doing this kind of task, category-based retrieval, query by example, learning labels. So the overview is a little bit like this. I will introduce the basic concepts of category-based retrieval. Then I will focus on supervised approaches for learning semantic uh, labels or semantic uh, categories. I will highlight the, the typical approach to that, which is just three main big blocks, and in the end, I'm going to discuss these issues about classification methodology. So what is category-based retrieval? I highlighted it before. So we, the, the goal here is to find a music recording or a music document inside a collection. This collection can be very big, can be millions of items. But I want to find uh, recordings that share a specific or predefined characteristic. So. Uh, why that? So, in fact, categories or classes or these traits, it, it's a natural way of grouping things. So that's what we humans use to group. And, and many things, I mean, um, furniture, clothes, all these are categories. And in music, we also use categories. Depending on the social context or on the geographical context, your, these categories will be different. But the, the single fact of using a category to name a group of items, a group of music items, I, I guess this is general enough in, in all the world. So what do I mean by a category? A category can be any word or concept that can be used to describe a set of recordings, a set of music items that share some property, this property. So synonyms for categories can be property, class, type, kind, or like this. So as I said, categories are one of the most basic ways to represent and structure human knowledge. So we unconsciously do that. So we group items without even noticing it. And that's the way our knowledge is built. That's 
that comes from several studies. This book is from Western music tradition, but it, it also shows uh, the ways we Westerners conceptualize music. Uh, and I guess this is applicable to other contexts also. So basically, a category encapsulates a certain characteristic or an intrinsic feature of a group of items. And an interesting thing about categories is that prototypes emerge. So once you have a group of items, you can establish a prototype representing the whole group of items. And when you want to compare a new item, which you perhaps assume that believes to this group of items, you can compare it. You don't need to compare it against. In fact, when you process this information, you don't compare it against all possible items inside the group. You just compare it maybe to the prototype. And if it matches, or it, if, if there is a reasonable match, then you maybe go into a deeper comparison into the members of the, of the group. But this can really help you a lot. And this last point is to highlight that these categories, these groups of items, they, they, don't, they are not strict. I mean, they, there are no strict boundaries between them. They can be fuzzy, for example. Uh, one group and the other may touch at some point or not. And they can be organized. So one set can be a super set of another group, of another set, etc. So having all this in mind, I'm going to show you the query by example paradigm. So as I said, you have an example here, an audio file, which may be this song by the Beatles. Hope it goes. So what we do with this example is to process it by means of signal processing tools, by means of a computer, and infer or extract one of these categories. For example, I could say that this song is happy for me. I, I can have assigned this label to this song, happy. And the system automatically infers this, this label. Then what can we do with this label? So we can look into a big database of documents. We can go with this label and, and tell the system, OK, give me songs that share this label, that belong to this category. And that's what the system should do. So, oh. so it should retrieve you, for example. This song which, which doesn't share anything except the category that I consider it happy. So that's, that's the basic workflow of this category-based retrieval stuff. So I, and the important part, as you might guess, is this, is going from the signal to the concept. Once you have the concept and you have the concepts of the other songs, the rest of the, of the action is trivial. You know? Also notice that I, in, in this example, uh, maybe I, I don't really need the example. I, do, I could just query by, directly by the semantic concept. This is also uh, a possibility. The interesting thing about an example is that you may infer several semantic concepts and then query all of them together to be more precise in the query and to retrieve more exact matches. If you want to be more fuzzy, if you want to be more general, just query one label or one category and you are done. What is this useful for? I think it's evident. So it, it helps searching and organizing collections, especially when you have extremely big collections. Think that, for example, I, in today's stores uh, in, in the Western countries, for example, in iTunes, they, they claim to have around 20 million songs. So uh, getting a, a song there or getting what you want there it can become really difficult. And by means of these tools, I think it's the, it's the only way to go. 
uh, then to discover new, new documents. I mean, you discover, in fact, related documents because they share the category. And this also helps you in, in other more high-level concepts, maybe like music similarity or so. No, if, if a song shares many, many, many categories, then in the end, you must claim that these two pieces are very similar. In fact, you can look at Tversky's work, work uh, showing that if a pair of items share several properties, then they are considered similar or not. More examples about this query by example paradigm. So for example, you could query in Western music, you could query by genres. So we, we tend to, to categorize songs by genres. No? For example, I, I like bossa nova songs, which sound more or less like this. Then, given this example, uh, the system ideally should infer that it's a bossa nova song and should retrieve something like, like this. So, we are querying just with one category, so it doesn't need to, to, to have a melody. If, if, if we wanted it to have a melody, we should include the category melody here, no? Other examples are for mood. Uh, we could query for sad songs. Other examples are query songs that have that contain specific instruments. No, uh, maybe I, I'm a, I like playing electric guitar, and I want to retrieve songs that have this instrument. So this would be my example. And ideally, the system should return things like this, which also have the same instrument processed in the same way. Other type of queries I can think of are, for example, uh, dynamics. So I want music documents that fluctuate a lot in the volume or in the, in the loudness. Or maybe I want uh, some live recordings with uh, people clapping there, so something like this, because I want to get the live version of it. And I'm sure that uh, in the context of com music, you can think of many, many, many categories that would be interesting to, to infer from Signal and to be able to retrieve. You know? So, in the end, as I said, the important part is inferring this category, get going from the signal to the label. And uh, apart from the label, two important things that we should uh, consider is the confidence we have on this label we have inferred from the signal and the probability. So, uh, a song, uh, a music item is not 100% happy, it may have some degree of happiness. So, ideally, uh, these systems should also provide the label but also the probability of that label, and then the, how confident is the system in these two values that it has given. Maybe it gives you that it's 100% happy, but confidence is 0% on this decision. So then uh, it's, it's worth not taking it into account. No? And again, uh, labels need to make sense to a user if the system is user-centered, or maybe better for the com music project, uh, labels need to be uh, to make sense for a community of users, for a group of these. So, from category based retrieval, we see that there is a need of annotating music excerpts. And for annotating a music document, one needs to employ a taxonomy. One needs to decide on which concepts he will, he will use. So, how do, we use, how do we obtain these taxonomies? There are several ways of getting these taxonomies. So one is called the wisdom of the crowd or folksonomy. So basically is uh, whatever the majority of the people says, I consider that that music document is that category. Another option is to be based on the opinion of experts. So just uh, rely on, on their opinion. Or as I said, uh, maybe I want my own uh, system, and I think I on, me only, I have the truth, so I, that would be a, a personomy. 
it's only me deciding on the types of categories, on, on the categories that will be used. And again, depending on this taxonomy, uh, uh, well, these taxonomies keep in mind that they can overlap, that they can be, there can be several relation types, and in fact, these relation types between different categories is what brings us to ontologies, which is, again, a thing that needs to be constructed in the, com in the com music project for all these types of music that we will be dealing with. So how, do, how to obtain a taxonomy and how to approach these, these problems? There are two ways, two ways. One is unsupervised and the other is supervised. So in the unsupervised way, basically, we start from nothing. This is a more a bottom-up approach. So we, do, we don't employ a taxonomy, and we expect that the characteristics extracted from the signals, the, the values extracted from the signals, will, will provide us with some natural separations of the data. Then once we have these separations, we can make groups of data and then decide, OK, this group is majorly this category. This other group corresponds majorly to that other category. That's not the, the approach I will cover here, but I will cover the supervised approach. So that is, you decide on a taxonomy, and I repeat, you can decide on the basis of your personal choice, on the basis of an opinion of experts, on the basis of the opinion of several, several users. And then you try to map the features you extract from the signal, the, the numbers you compute from the signal, to these categories. How, you, how do you do that? With machine learning. And here is where you use the typical learning algorithms. So which is the typical approach to do that? So you have some audio which is labeled, so maybe an expert has given labels, categories for that audio. You extract features, you process the signal, and you extract a low dimensional representation of this signal, so a set of numbers. From these numbers, you process them, you transform them a little bit so that they better reflect the qualities you want to highlight about this signal. And once you have done this processing, you train a classifier, that's an algorithm, which basically provides you, well, this is in the training phase. So you train a classifier to learn these relations, to learn this mapping from numbers extracted from the signal to categories. Then when you have some audio that it's unlabeled, so there is no need to label the whole corpus. You can just label a part of it. That's the, that's the trick of the thing. So you do the same process. You extract the same features in the same way. You apply the same transformation and the same selection you did it with before. But now the classifier, instead of learning, classifies directly and provides you the annotation, the category, the probability of this annotation, and how confident is the classifier about this decision. So these are the two ways, training and testing. So let's give some words about the first part, feature extraction. So there are many numbers which can be computed from an audio signal. I'm sure you can think of many of them. And uh, if you look to any paper in the literature, uh, you will find tons of features. So basically, you can focus on the temporal aspect of the signal. For example, in the zero crossing rate, in the energy of the signal, etc. But you can also look at the spectrum of the signal. And from the spectrum, uh, famous uh, features are the MFCCs, LPCs, uh, bark band energies, etc. In Western music, as we, um, well, I, I was about to say we have this equal tempered system, but uh, as we assume we use this equal tempered system, uh, we use this tonal representation, which is chroma, which is basically a, a much more simpler version of the histograms that uh, Baris has shown. So in our case, we just use 12 bins for these histograms, corresponding to the 12 nodes. This is a lo very low dimensional representation, but no nonetheless very informative for the, for the Western pieces. Or you could try to extract some rhythmic information. For example, in the onsets of the song or the intervals between the onsets, a histogram of these intervals, etc. And the trick is that these features are extracted just 
So if you are if you are analyzing a big document, you, you just extract them for sh very short excerpts, and you keep doing it for the whole document. So some of these features, well, for example, in the case of spectrums, you can use, I mean, you can invent your own features. So that's the point. Uh, you can maybe you could say maybe okay I try I define the slope of the spectrum to be a feature I define the kurtosis of the spectrum so if it is wider or more peaky to be to be a feature I define the skewness of the spectrum to be a feature whatever the MFCCs um, I don't want to give much detail to that so basically it's applying a series of filter banks to the signal and get it, see annotating the energy corresponding to these filter banks after uh, cosine transform. In the case of chroma features, it's the same. So that was what I, what I was explaining about this histogram with 12 pitches. So the, the key thing is that these features are extracted for, for very short uh, periods of time. But then you need to aggregate all this information into a compact vector for processing it with machine learning algorithms. And this aggregation is important because you are summarizing the features to represent the global characteristic of the audio document you want to analyze. How do you do it? Well, means, variances, statistical moments, derivatives, other things, and one could think of more exotic ways of aggregating all this information. The important message here is the features you choose and the way you aggregate them to represent the whole document depend on the task, depend on the category you choose. So, I mean, I would be a fool if I would try to do raga recognition with MFCCs. MFCCs do not provide any information about uh, the the melody at all. It it just provide a rough. It just, they just provide a rough description of the spectrum, and this this is absolutely not correlated with with what you would understand by a raga. So this means that, for for example, if you want to detect ragas with machine learning, first extract features that are meaningful, and moreover, summarize them in a way that it's meaningful. The mean frequency of the, the mean pitch of the song is not meaningful at all. And the, maybe the variance has some, some meaning, but I doubt it. So uh, we should look for ways to aggregate this information that makes sense for the category you want to infer. Next step is to post-process a little bit uh, this vector of aggregated information. So what you do basically is a normalization. So each feature you want to count it the same. So the classifier, the, the algorithm will decide on the, the proper weight of it. But you don't want to bias a priori towards any feature. Since many classifiers uh, work with Gaussian distributions, uh, maybe a good idea is to Gaussianize the features. There are some nonlinear transforms to do this process. Uh, other things you want to do before classifying is try to detect correlated features. So if two, if two numbers tell you the same thing and they are very correlated, when both are high or both are low, but never they, are, they, they do not coincide, you might better discard one because they are providing exactly the same information. So in the end, what you want to do is to remove features that do not provide information for the task. And another important thing you want to do to apply machine learning algorithms is to reduce the dimensionality. So the higher the dimensionality, the, the more difficult is the class. The, the more difficult is the problem for the, for the algorithm. The, the worst is the performance. But more importantly, uh, doing this feature selection and feature transformation allows you to learn a lot about the music you are considering and allows, uh, allows you to learn a lot about the task and the category you are considering. Because in this intermediate step is where you see how the numbers extracted from the signals match the category, which match the category, which do not match. And then you start thinking, OK, why this number doesn't match and why this number matches, why this summarization method works, why not? So already in this step, you can see that. Uh, ways for doing that, uh, for example, a, a basic way to, to do feature uh, selection is principal component analysis. This is just a linear transform. So let's say you have these two numbers, x2 and x1. 
here, and so it's just a linear mapping to P1, PC1 and PC2. So basically what, what you do is that you eliminate redundancy. You see that now the points are more uh, well distributed across these two axes. And the, the other thing it does this transformation is that you decorrelate the variables. So here you had two variables that were highly correlated, but by this transform you decorrelate them. And the interesting thing is that it can be used to reduce the number of features. Maybe you decide that this component is not important because the variance here is not really that much. So we ju you just can go from two components to just one. So, but what are the drawbacks? So it assumes some homogeneity of the distribution. So it assumes that the data is more or less homogeneity distributed here. And the worst thing for interpreting the result is that you lose information about which specific feature it is. So PC1 is a linear combination of X2 and X1. Therefore, uh, and when, when you extend this to higher dimensions, PC1 is going to be a linear combination of many dimensions. So you lose the information of the original dimensions. But it helps you a lot in compacting information and achieving better results for the classifier. So it, there is this trade-off. Another way of selecting features is the so-called Fisher's ratio or Fisher's criteria. So basically, um, Let's suppose you have a feature J and then two classes, I and I prime. So basically what you do is to just compute the difference between the means of these features and then divide by the, to the standard deviation. So if, if the means are close, this is going to be zero and then the ratio is going to be zero. This means that the two features already provide the same information, so you are not interested in one of them. Uh, if the variances are very high, this value is also be close to zero. So if, the, if one feature has a big variance and the other also has a big variance, maybe you want to get rid of one of these features. But then this proceeds in, in, in a pairwise fashion. So you need to decide some strategies to, to, perf to, to finally select a compact group of features. There are several ones. Maybe I, I would have to skip it. And talking about ways of selecting appropriate features, here you have many of them. There are methods based on correlation between features. Remember that we said that we wanted uncorrelated features to provide the most of information to our algorithms. There are uh, methods, there are chi-square methods, methods based on gain ratios, etc. And uh, there are also methods based on the algorithm you want to use them. So you start classifying with one feature, um, based on the algorithm you are going to use later and trying to select which features are better for which algorithm. So in the end, you, s you input all these features to a classifier algorithm. What types of classifiers we have? The simplest ones may be the probabilistic classifiers. So basically, given a set of features, so n features here, you want to know the probability of a given category given these features. So how do we do that? The, the simplest way is by employing the bias rule. The bias rule, you reverse this, this concept here. So this is the probability of the class, which you already know because that's your training set. You know how many items belong to a certain class. This is the probability of the features. This is a constant, and it's going to be constant for all classes, so it can be gone. It can go outside, so in fact, that's this Z term here. And then you make the naive conditional independence assumption, which means that uh, each feature is independent of each other. If you apply the correct transformation, then features will be independent. And then you can apply this assumption, and therefore this results in a very easy formula. You, you just need to compute this probability here. So how do you compute the probability that a given feature value, that the probability of a given feature of a feature value given the, the category. Well, a common choice may be a Gaussian. That's, a, that's the most typical uh, way of computing probabilities. No? You have the mean for the category. You have the standard deviation of the category. Then given the value, you can obtain the probability of this exact value given the category. So this solves the formula. Employing Gaussian mixtures, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a very simple way to try to uh, emulate or estimate any given distribution. So it's just a matter of how many Gaussians you consider, just a matter of how many products, how many sums you do in the end. 
other classifiers, for example, neural networks, very used. A neural network basically consists of three layers, an input layer, an output layer, and a hidden layer, or several hidden layers with several neurons there. And basically, in training, you input your examples here, and based on the output, you refine the weights of all the connections in the network, and you keep doing this iteratively until you achieve some conversions. Simplest classifier, maybe, is the k nearest neighbors classifier. So in this case, we have two categories. We have the tri red triangle category and the blue square category. They are in some space, here a two-dimensional space. And then what you do is, given a new item, which you don't know to which class it belongs, what you do is just basically look for the nearest neighbors, maybe the three nearest neighbors. So if you look at the three nearest neighbors, you would say, oh, oh this is a triangle, because it has two triangles who are very close to it. However, if you looked at a more uh, distant radius, you would have three squares here and only two triangles, then you would change your decision. So. In fact, selecting this radius is a, is a crucial parameter of the algorithm. However, the, the k-nearest neighbors classifier works well when the, the data is not well distributed. So let's say you have a mixture of squares and triangles all over the space. So then maybe you just rely on one or two nearest neighbors, and you, you, could do, you could achieve a really good classification by this method if your distribution of features is very sparse. Another classifier very popular is the trees. Trees are good because they allow you to see which feature is uh, doing what. So once you have calculated the tree, you see, ah, OK, this number I computed from the signal allows me to distinguish between this class and this class. So that's an interesting feature of, of trees. They operate basically by thresholding. So given a, a feature, uh, they decide for a threshold. If the, if the value of that feature is below the threshold, you put it into one branch. If the value of that feature is above the threshold, you put it into another branch. However, uh, there is a drawback with trees, and it's that they don't usually provide a very good performance. So it, they are good for assessing your uh, features, but maybe not good for the final application. Maybe the most famous classifier, super vector machines, uh, they also try to divide the space, to divide items that belong to the category from items that do not belong to the category. Uh, they basically operate by means of the so-called kernel trick. So the kernel trick consists in a mapping of your features, which can, be, which can have a quite random distribution in the original space. But by means of this mapping, you expect that then they are easily separable in the new space. They, they are easily partitionable. So you select, inf to, there are several techniques to look for this, uh, for the best plane separating the two populations. And then you select the few items which are close to the border, and these are the so-called super vectors. And the list of classifiers is endless. So um, there are several classifiers which you could use, logistic regressors, uh, hidden Markov models. And you could even choose ensembles of classifiers. So trying to combine the decisions of several classifiers, or even applying a meta classifier, classifying the decisions of, meta of, of other classifiers into a new decision so that everything is more robust. Maybe you would think, oh, but th this is a lot of stuff. I need to implement everything. I need to, to work from, to do a lot of work to just infer a, a single category. That's not true. There are several software packages you can use. And without just a little bit of knowledge and just uh, taking care of some basic issues that I will highlight next, uh, you can get really uh, good performances from this package. I'm very used to use Weka. Weka is a, is a software tool where you basically can view and classify data, both, both supervisedly and unsupervisedly. RapidMiner is also a very common tool, but then there are other tools for MATLAB, for Python, for R, etc. Now I, I move to the last part. So given that we have these tools, we need to know some general rules when performing the experiments. This way, we will be able to concentrate 
on the feature extraction part and on the summarization part. But there are some things we need to, to take care of. So the first one is, once you extract your features from the signal, once you extract some numbers from the signal, do a visual inspection of them. It's not just a matter of seeing if you got some infinite values or <laughs> non-allocated values numbers. So it's a matter of seeing how your data is. So for example, in this case, if you see a distribution of your feature like this, maybe a tree would work a lot, will work better. So this already provides you a hint of uh, which classifier to use. No, here we see two, two very def well-defined thresholds. So that indicates that maybe a tree with this distribution would work. Or if you plot one feature versus the other and you see a distribution like this, you can already get rid of one feature and reducing dimensionality. So feature one is useless if you also consider feature two. Or here, if you plot your two features and gives you, so here you have three categories, green, blue, and, and red, and you have a plot like this, uh, you can guess that a Gaussian distribution, maybe I would use a Gaussian distribution if I, a Gaussian mixture model if I see this, no? One Gaussian for the green, two Gaussians for the red ones, and maybe two Gaussians or three for the blue ones, and that would be done. You, you, would, you don't need a super vector machine or a more complicated algorithm if you see this feature. Another issue you need to take care of, and that's a personal rule. Do not classify M items with D features when D is larger or comparable to M. Saying, saying it like this may be a little bit uh, difficult to understand, but if, it's very easy if you think, for example, in two items, so this point and this point, you have two recordings, and you want to classify them into two categories, either being live and not live. So how would you partition this space? This way? This way? This way? So wh when the number of items is, is, is comparable to the number of dimensions, you can partition the space in any way. Any way will perform the task. Any way will classify correctly. So as a personal rule of thumb, I use that the, at least the dimensionality has to be higher. So the, the number of items has to be higher than 20 times the dimensionality, at least. Otherwise, you don't get meaningful classifications. Next thing. Be careful when comparing approaches that use a different number of features. So you may analyze uh, some set of recordings with 20 features, 20 dimensions, and you may analyze another set of recordings with, maybe you are comparing classifiers, which classifier performs best. But in one you use 20 features and in the other you use 30 features. That's not a fair comparison. I mean, one classifier has more information than the other one. So if you comp if you compare the approaches, use the same number of features. Also, use the... What? Feature selection. That, that feature selection, yeah, that's... But it depends on, on, the, on the conclusions you want to extract from the experiment. Depends on the conclusions you want to get from the experiment. If you claim that the system using 20 features is better than the system using 10 features, I, I have a strong objection with that. I mean, uh, I, I do not agree. Okay, if, if they are noise, maybe yes, but <laughs> if they are noise, why don't you discard them and compare 10 and 10? Yeah, well, at least you should provide uh, enough evidence to support that. Yeah, okay, L let's, let's talk about that later. Uh, next thing is using the same amount of instances per class. You can, you can consider that, and in fact, we have seen in the formula of the Bayesian classifier that it has a specific part of it that compensates for this fact. But there are some classifiers which do not really take care of that. So the best way to proceed, I would say, is, OK, let's normalize first by taking random sampling. So in, you take a random sampling as big as the less populated class, 
and then you perform several experiments with several random samplings. That's known as the Monte Carlo approach. The next thing to take care of is to avoid overfitting. So let's say we have here these two types of dots. So we see that a way of correctly separating them, a way, a way of correctly classifying them is just this straight line. But what happens when we have less dots and we want to infer a way of separating it? We could infer that maybe this is the best way of separating it given this training data. However, once we get the rest of the dots, we see that we have committed three errors. Whereas if we had chosen a simplest way of separating the data, we would just have committed one error maybe. So this, is, this problem is known as overfitting. So, and it's, it can be expressed in, in the way of using learning algorithms that generalize well using simple learning algorithms. That's the way to ensure that new unlabeled classifiers will be classified with the same accuracy as the ones you employed in the training set. So, which are the ways of uh, avoiding overfitting? Well, use, apart from using a simple classifier and generalizing well, uh, algorithms, using algorithms that generalize well, the way to avoid overfitting is to do cross-validation. So that's it. Once, once you have your data, you split it into two sets and you train with one, but then you test with a set that you didn't use for training. And ideally, you should do a cross-fault validation. So you separate your train set into six sets, and then you train with one part, test with the other, and then repeat this several times. Plus, repeating it with several Monte Carlo iterations if you did the, the Monte Carlo sampling before. There are other ways of, of doing cross-validation, leave one out cross-validation, uh, stratified cross-validation, etc. With all of them, again, you need to ensure an, a sufficient number of repetitions. Then another thing when using these packages for machine learning is that you should check for the default parameters of your classifier. I remember the first time I, I, imp I had some data, I wanted to do some classification, and I, I used a tree to classify and I obtained 100% accuracy. I was amazed. Uh, I was a newbie, and I thought that I had discovered the moon. But uh, it turns out that the, the minimum min number of instances per tree branch was set to 1. <laughs> this means that the tree was splitting, splitting, and splitting until it had only one item in each branch. Then, of course, at each branch, <laughs> the classification there is perfect. It's 100%. No? So, Another important parameter in the k-nearest neighbors is the number of neighbors you consider. So if you consider the whole training set as neighbors, then it makes no sense. If you just consider one neighbor, if your space is quite homogeneous, it doesn't make sense also. The same can be said about the complexity parameter in, the, in a super vector machine. Or in any classifier using distances, you need to be very careful on which distance you use. And also, not all classifiers normalize features, so it's better to rescale features before, etc. Also, if you are dedicated to extract features and to see if these features, if these parameters you compute from the signal are good in describing the, a certain category, what you want to do is to evaluate your features and to, to assess if these features uh, provide information for the machine learning algorithm to infer a category. How do you do that? Well, a first uh, way of doing is using several classifiers. So the, the, the information provided by the features should be able to be exploited by not only one type of classifier, but several types of classifiers should be able to exploit the information of that feature. If several classifiers work, then you can, be more, you can assure that that features provide relevant information to the classifier. Also, it's a good idea to include a one-rule classifier. A one-rule classifier is a simple classifier working with just one feature. If you get the, mostly the same accuracy with just one feature than with the whole set of features, then this means that the whole set of features is meaningless. With one feature, you would do the same, or more or less the same. Apart from using several classifiers to test the usefulness of your features, you should, you should use several data sets. That's very common in in experiments with Western music, people just uses one data set or one set of elements 
applies a classification, sometimes just using one classifier, and they say, hey, these features I have designed, they provide a really good accuracy in this category-based uh, task. That's not true. You should use different data sets and different classifiers. Also, you should report on the random baseline, which is the, F, the accuracy of just guessing by chance. But not only the average accuracy. I want to see the maximum value, because if just one time, you guessing by chance, you achieve the same accuracy as you achieve with your classifier, that's not meaningful for me, unless you run the experiment more than 100 times, and it was this only happened one time. So you should also report. I am tired of seeing papers which do not report random baselines properly. They don't even provide the mean value, and if they provide the mean value, they don't provide even a standard deviation. So you cannot assess that. And if you are assessing your features, your extraction from the signal, you should include a baseline feature. You should at least provide the typical feature used for the task or very well-known features to compare against. It, it doesn't make sense to, to just provide accuracies for one feature alone. You should compare these accuracies with other features. So summarizing, comparing accuracies for multiple classifiers, for multiple data sets, and with known features and reporting the baselines. So for example, this is an experiment we did. We were uh, developing these new features called spectral-based, uh, uh, shape-based spectral contrast features. So you see that here we had two data sets labeled with the same categories. We were trying to assess if this new feature uh, provide a, provided a, a better information for a classification task. It was a general classification task in this case. So here what we did was to consider the most typical feature for the task, the MFCC, then another feature, which is which was a, a, a in fact our feature was an enhanced feature of the second one. So we considered these two features. The baseline was reported were reported in the cap, the table caption, the two data sets here, and then we used three three different classifiers. So how can you claim that your features really work better than the others by looking at all the results? So we see that for each classifier. The, the results are better than the standard features. We see that for both data sets, the results improve. So this is the way of doing a proper assessment with this automatic annotation. But here, there is one thing missing, which is uh, statistical significance. There are very easy tests for statistical significance. So uh, let's do them. Let's apply them. Even the packages that provide the machine learning algorithms usually provide a way of assessing if the difference between two accuracies are statistically significant or not. So that was the end of the talk. So uh, I started by um, describing this scenario consisting in retrieving music based on automatic labels inferred from the signal. And for that, we need to assign labels or classes, probabilities, and confidences of these of these values to, uh, to audio. This takes us to the automatic annotation task, which consists of three main steps, feature extraction, feature transformation, and, fi and classification. In our case, and especially dealing with uh, the, mu the music that we will, this, we, will, we, will in the we will deal in the Commusic project, uh, I would concentrate in the feature extraction and aggregation part, and uh, using this, with some care, taking into account the considerations, we the issues we have seen with these classification tasks. So uh, here I, I provide some references for the interested readers. I will put the handouts for these slides in my web page. So when I go back to Spain, I will, you will have the handouts there for the references if you want to check them and so on. Yeah, I, the most simple strategy would be to try to get a transformation that transforms everything into the same duration. 
the, the problem is that then uh, it may the problem may become computationally unfeasible. So usually, yeah, not not necessarily resampling. I mean, it, it's I think it's our work to to try to design this the, the good the good transformation for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, we have this paper. Well, <laughs> well, the, we have this paper. This is mainly the work of my colleague Cyril Laurier. So, uh, in here, uh, we were testing. We were doing precisely these tasks for for some uh, moods. For most based on Western music. So basically, uh, in the features we used here were mostly a spectral, uh, but also some tonal features. For example, the mode, or the, in Western music, we have the if the, if the major is, is major mode, minor mode. For example, for aggressiveness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, the tempo is very correlated with sad no lower tempos tend to be so the aggregation of all these features provide you good ways of classifying okay so thank you very much so let's take